In the absence of visible light, you can't see anything. It's all black. But some living organisms like corals and deep sea marine animals that live in these dark environments have the ability to fluoresce. This means they reflect light to produce these awesome glowing colors like you see here. So how does fluorescence work? Fluorescence occurs in three key steps. First, light, represented here by this green squiggly line, shines down. Light is made of packets of energy called photons. Photons are absorbed by fluorophores, which are molecules in the fluorescing organism, like coral. Because the fluorophore is absorbing the energy of the photon, we say that it gets excited to a higher energy level. It now has more energy than before. Lastly, we apply the idea of what goes up must come down. So you can guess that the fluorophore has to release the energy that it previously gained. It does this by releasing the energy back as a light photon. And this is the light that we see as fluorescence. Now one thing to note is that sometimes we need a special sort of light to initiate the energy absorption, excitation, and release stages that are part of the fluorescence process that we just went over. Here is a diagram of different types of light and energy. What we see in our everyday lives with our naked eyes is visible light. The red, orange, yellow, green, blue, and purple rainbow-like colors here. But this UV light is often key to fluorescence. Have you heard of it before? We need special tools like a microscope to help us see the fluorescence. Now that we have a basic understanding of the mechanics of how fluorescence works, let's return back to where we started. We showed you cool pictures of corals and minerals that fluoresce. Can you think of any animals that make light? It's important that we make a distinction between fluorescence and other types of glowing. For example, maybe you thought of fireflies or anglerfish as animals that make light. And they do, but they do it in a way that is different from fluorescence. These animals are bioluminescent, which means they produce light entirely on their own through chemical reactions. This is in contrast to fluorescent animals, which need some light in the first place to emit more light. Can you think of an example of where we might find bioluminescent versus where we might find fluorescent animals in the deep ocean? Or how about another question? Do you think humans fluoresce? Have you seen yourself or your friends or your family glow? If you have, then it was not fluorescence because we don't have the right molecular composition to do so. But maybe you've seen a picture like this. With the right tools, we can see light that has been released by our bodies. We could consider ourselves glowing. Okay, so people might kind of glow, but we don't really fluoresce. But where else might we be fine fluorescence? We've already mentioned corals in the sea, but there are plenty of other animals that fluoresce. Why might it be beneficial for some animals like these frogs to fluoresce? Well, regardless of why these animals fluoresce for their own benefit, our human society has benefited tremendously from fluorescent animals, specifically fluorescent jellyfish. Here's the story of how scientists discovered an important fluorescent molecule called green fluorescent protein. Back in the 1960s, a young scientist named Osamu Shimomura was interested in understanding why some organisms glow. He was particularly interested in studying a water jellyfish in San Juan Island in Washington State. Several scientists, including Shimomura, traveled to Washington State where they used nets to collect by hand approximately 10,000 jellyfish, separating the outer ring of the jellyfish that contains green light emitting segments and discarding the rest. They then ground the harvested parts and passed them through a cheesecloth to form what the scientists called the squeezette. From this, they isolated a protein that would glow when exposed to UV light. This protein was called green fluorescent protein, or GFP. 
Over the following decades, its potential for use in research was realized. Following Shimomura's work, another scientist named Martin Shelfi also became interested in GFP. He identified the DNA sequence of GFP and inserted it into a bunch of different organisms who can now make their own GFP. When these organisms were exposed to UV light, they emitted a green fluorescence, as this protein had done on its own in a test tube in Shimomura's laboratory. More scientists started playing with the GFP DNA. Roger Sine tweaked the DNA in such a way that it gave rise to mutant variants of the GFP molecule. These variants can produce different wavelengths of light and therefore different colors of fluorescence. Fluorescence is not just pretty glowing things, scientists use it to study processes that were never seen before, quite literally illuminated and able to be analyzed as they happen inside living cells. They do this by fusing GFP or any other fluorescent protein to the protein of interest. You can now visualize this protein of interest inside a cell because you've labeled it with a fluorescent marker. You can use this to look at a cell dividing in a petri dish or look at neurons inside mice brain or inside the bodies of fruit flies. Because GFP is extremely useful to scientific research, it won the prestigious Nobel Prize for Chemistry in 2008. It was awarded to the three scientists we spoke about earlier. For years now, fluorescence-based research has been happening all around the world. It also happens right here in your backyard at Cornell University in Ithaca. We will now hear from some Cornell graduate students how they use fluorescence in their experiments. Hi, uh, my name is Bhargav Sankedi. Uh, I'm a PhD student at Cornell University. Uh, so I come here from Bangalore, India. Uh, so I grew up all my life in India and I did my undergraduate studies there and during the course of my undergraduate studies I really I mean I, I realized that I really like solving puzzles um, and I feel science is a way for me to do that and make money out of it um, so every day I spend my life uh, trying to break down large problems into smaller more digestible problems and trying to solve these small problems in order to finally answer the bigger questions that I have. Um, in my research, uh, I try to understand how our small intestines are formed. So small intestines are the organs in your body that allow you to digest food. Uh, however, if you've ever seen one of these images, you would see that they are really long. They're like 20 feet long and they fit into this small abdominal cavity. So they're all scrunched up inside. Um, and if you've ever put a long thread in your pocket, you would realize that it very quickly gets knotted up. My research tries to understand how that is prevented in the case of the small intestine. How do you prevent the small intestine from getting knotted up? Um, I mainly use chicken embryos and mouse embryos to answer these questions. So I try to understand in these embryos how the gut goes from a simple tube into making this highly looped structure and how it ensures that it doesn't get knotted up. Uh, so here we are in our microscope room and this particularly is a dissection fluorescent scope. Um, so today I'm going to try to show you an experiment where um, we wanted to know what would happen if we removed a certain protein from mouse guts, right? And we were particularly interested in what would happen to the blood vessels that supply to the uh, supply blood to the mouse gut if this particular protein was removed. And I want to show you the the results of this experiment through fluorescence. Um, so in this experiment, we were trying to understand what would happen if a certain protein was removed from the mouse gut. Uh, and its effect on the blood vessels that supply uh, blood to the gut, which is the intestine. So here you can see in an embryonic mouse gut that uh, with the protein, so these are mice with the protein still intact, you can see that there is a lot of blood vessels within the mouse gut. And we are marking these green blood vessels using a marker that specifically recognizes these blood vessels and you can see that it's normally there. However, in a mouse that does not have that protein, 
you will see that in their guts blood vessels are much less which means that that protein was absolutely essential for proper development of those blood vessels. In this way, we can use a combination of fluorescence and mouse genetics to understand uh, the contribution of different proteins for proper functioning of organisms. So, as you can see with the exp experiment I showed you, fluorescence allows you to mark structures within organisms which would otherwise be impossible to see through your naked eyes. But marking these specific structures with fluorescent proteins or fluorescent markers, uh, microscopes can pick up these signals and you can now actually visualize these markers and that will allow you to understand what will happen when certain proteins go away to certain structures within the organism. Through this, we can not only know what is happening during development, but also during disease. So, a certain marker might be able to tell you how, uh, for example, this marker that I showed you that marks blood vessels might be able to show you how during a certain disease, blood vessels in your body are affected and how that might be related to the disease uh, the patient is suffering from. Hello, my name is Mariela. I'm a grad student at Cornell University and I did my undergrad in Bennington College uh, and I have a master's from Hunter College in New York City. I'm actually originally from the Dominican Republic, but I grew up in New York City. So here at Cornell, I study neurodegenerative diseases. And specifically, my lab studies how the, uh, some mutations cause different neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, ALS, or other types of dementia. As you can see here, this is one of my favorite posters, it's right next to my bench, uh, where we have different mechanisms that are affected within the cell, in the brains of, uh, of individuals that, have, that are suffering from neurodegeneration. And in my lab, we specifically study different mechanisms that, uh, that are affected when there's neurodegeneration, like the cell quality control. This means the, like the cleaning mechanisms that the cell has to keep itself healthy. And specifically, I study the cellular trash can or the lysosome in which uh, proteins can be recycled, just like in a trash can you can recycle some things or degrade it completely, thrown away. Um, so this is my, my desk. And one of my favorite things about my lab is the windows that allows me to have beautiful succulents and plants that are flowering or looking nice year-round, making the space very, very homey for me. So this is my bench, and this is where all the cutting-edge science occurs. And I'm gonna talk, show you guys, actually, some of the things that I do. So we, I study neurodegeneration, meaning it have, it's happening in the brain. So we have model organisms that we study this, because we cannot study this in people. And my lab uses mice to study this. So we have mutant mice. And we compare them to wild type mice, meaning we have mice that have a mutation that gives them some type of neurodegeneration and mice that are normal. And we can take the, the brains from these mice and examine how the lysosome that I mentioned before, the, the cellular trash can, is uh, how it's different in the normal mouse compared to the mutant mouse. And we can also look at inflammation because inflammation is a big part of neurodegeneration, how the brain the brain has a lot of inflammation that leads to many cells dying. So we want to examine how this inflammation is occurring and what we can do to maybe stop the progression of the inflammation. Well, today I'm going to tell you guys about the different type of experiments that we do in the lab. We use fluorescent microscopy to look at, at different neurodegeneration models, specifically mice models. So we are studying the, the brain. So we have to collect brain from mutant mice that, are, that have a mutation that leads them to have some neurodegenerative diseases and compare it to mice that are normal or have no neurodegeneration. So if you come closer, you can see some of the brain sections that I have obtained from mice. So I have a mouse, I collect the brain, and I make slices of the brain. And then these slices, I can add antibodies to tag different proteins that I'm looking at, like the lysosome that I mentioned to you guys, so the cellular trash can, or the inflammation molecules that are so important for brain health.
So I want to show you guys some of the images using the fluorescent microscope. So this is a fluorescent microscope. And I am using this fluorescent microscope to analyze wild type and mutant mice. I am looking at the level of inflammation in the mutant mice. And this mutation causes changes in the lysosome function or cellular trash can. And this leads to, one of, one of the things that it leads to is rampant or about, uh, constant inflammation. So I am comparing wild type and, and mutant mice inflammatory levels. So in this image, I am showing one of the immune cells of the brain, the microglia. And you can see that they are present. And we need the immune cells to be present to survey or um, move around and explore and make sure that everything is going fine in the brain. However, when we have a type of mutation that affects uh, cell cleaning mechanisms, we see that there's an abundance, even more of these cells. And this is not a good thing because this causes inflammation to be excessive and it may even lead to more neurodegeneration. Fluorescent microscopy is one of the techniques that I use to study neurodegeneration. However, this technique can also be used to label different uh, different cells. So I labeled an immune cell, but it could be labeled other types of cells or even organelles or different compartments within the cell, like the lysosome or cellular trash can. And this technique goes beyond my studies. It can be used to study other type of diseases like cancer. And this is what excites me the most about being a scientist, is that you can use a technique to, to, to answer many types of questions. And part of answering the questions comes troubleshooting. If something doesn't work, you go back to the bench or back to your notebook and read or, and figure out other ways to answer a question. And this is, to me, the most important part of being a scientist and the most exciting part because you're always being engaged talking to other scientists or talking to your PI or your professor. My advice to students who are interested in pursuing science is sincerely not to give up. Keep trying. There, Let's say your school doesn't offer any other science act related activity aside from the science class. There are many companies out there that have science internship for high schoolers or there's many or reach out to a professor in a university. That says a lot when your level of engagement, if you communicate your interest to, to pro a professor, to a scientist, that I would feel like honored to receive such an email and I will try to help you out. So be an advocate for yourself and reach out to, to others if you cannot find some science-related science activity at your schools. I believe that Science is not necessarily something that's only done in the lab. Science is there in every day of your life. You notice things around you, but you don't know why those things are happening that way. Uh, and trying to find an answer out for that is science. Uh, and, you know, if you keep doing it, there will come a point where you're able to answer a lot of questions about how things are happening around you, and you'll be left with m even more questions uh, about how things are happening, and you don't know those answers. That's when you're really motivated to do this as a full-time job. And the best part, you get paid every day to do something you enjoy, to solve puzzles, to find out new things about the world and to see things that nobody has ever seen. That's why I love doing science. And if you are interested in asking questions and having fun and learning something new every day, science could be a fun career path for you too. Okay, so we just heard firsthand from scientists on how fluorescence is critical to their research. But beyond these Ben scientists, there are a lot of cool ways that people use fluorescence. For example, in the medical field, fluorescence can be used to mark some cancer cells, so you can distinguish cancer cells from healthy cells. And in forensics, we know that human saliva naturally fluoresces, so that forensic scientists can use this in their detective work. And what about you? How can you use fluorescence? A fun experiment that you can do at home is to see what objects around your house fluoresce. All you need is a special kind of light called a backlight. Do you remember we talked about different kinds of light and how they relate to fluorescence? 
Well, you can buy the slide at a hardware store or online. Then make some hypotheses about what types of object will fluoresce and test them. Thanks for joining us today. We hope you learned some new things and came away with new questions. Don't forget to share them with a friend.